Hello and welcome back to the Salvatore Show. Today I have a special podcast interview with Member of Parliament for Leeds North West, Alex Sobel, MP. I'll be asking him questions on anti-Semitism in the UK, following on from my participation in the Holocaust Educational Trust's Anti-Semitism in the UK course. Thank you for joining me. Um, my first question I have is, as the Vice Chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Anti-Semitism, what does your role entail and can you tell the listeners what work the group does? So the, the, the group really is about, um, one, highlighting the level of anti-Semitism in the UK and also undertaking work work around what's being done on anti-Semitism. So for instance, we have three or four times a year, we have a visit for parliamentarians, MPs and peers uh, to um, visit uh, um, organisations such as Jewish schools, community security trust, synagogues, uh, JW3, which is a Jewish um, community centre in North London, Finchley Road, etc. Uh, to, to highlight both the level of anti-Semitism, how people, how it affects people, and what work's being done around it. We also undertake inquiries. So the most recent inquiries I was involved with, and our most recent inquiry was about anti-Semitism in higher education, particularly at un on university campuses. And we published a report on that, which people can read. So, so we look at particular instances and particular types of anti-Semitism in particular places as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, and you just mentioned the Community Security Trust, but according to uh, the trust, last year, 1,652 anti-Jewish hate incidents were recorded nationwide. This is the fifth highest annual total ever rep uh, reported to the CST. In recent years, what has been the cause of such a high amount of hate incidents? I think one, there's been an increased level of reporting and also as you can imagine, we've had a huge increase in online anti-Semitism. So it's given uh, forums for anti-Semites to expound their views. Um, but the other thing that, that we generally find is, and this is, you know, and, and, and this is a, a point you can sometimes debate, that when uh, things become difficult in Israel, where there are flashpoints, and a lot of diaspora don't necessarily agree with the Israeli government uh, on, on those issues, then that heightens the level of anti-Semitism and anti-Jewish um, hatred and attacks. So, you know, in recent years, we've obviously just had a had a, a particularly uh, right-wing government elected in Israel, probably the most right-wing government that's ever been elected in, in the state of Israel, where, where now ministers in that government have made very strongly, and I think there's no, you know, there's no point pretending otherwise, strongly anti-Palestinian statements and are trying to enact anti-Palestinian policy um, and we've had you know issues like Sheikh Jarrah and others which are, which are widely known in the UK and that has raised the temperature um, but I think actually more broadly in society we have it, that's not the only cause there are a number of other underlying issues uh, that unfortunately mean that the Jewish people are seeing a, a rise in in hatred uh, towards them Thank you. Um, and what more do you think the government or local authorities can do to combat this rise in anti-Jewish hate incidents? I think that local authorities, whether there are large Jewish populations, are really good. I mean, in Leeds, Leeds City Council does a really good job of working with the Leeds Jewish Representative Council. I understand it's the same in places like Manchester, uh, and Liverpool and Bury Council and in councils in North London where there are large Jewish communities. Um, so the, the, the local authorities, it's a more general point, obviously, are very um, resource denied. So it's really about how they work with local communal organisations, representative councils and community security trust, uh, but they're doing their best. In terms of um, legislation, I think actually... Um, some of the, you know, so we had we had the the um, inquiry on anti-Semitism on campus. I and this is maybe a controversial view. I think that the recent 
legislation on free speech on university campuses is a retrograde step for Jewish people because, for instance, it makes, you know, I, I thought when I was a student and lots of other people in the, in the Jewish society did at Leeds to retain a no-platform policy when two well-known fascists, um, Mark Collett, who's still a well-known fascist, who runs the Patriotic Alliance now, and Chris Beverly tried to overturn it, and that was a long time ago. So actually a no-platform policy, no-platform to, to, to fascists uh, and other people with extreme racist views protect Jewish people. And the government, through their, I don't know, support for, for an extreme version, I'd say, of free, freedom of speech, which doesn't actually create protections for minorities, it's just like a sort of libertarian view of free, free, free speech, which is a valid political position, but not one I agree with, um, means that we have less protection for Jewish students yeah. on campus. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and as we've mentioned, these hate incidents have also appeared online. And in 2020, yourself and Andrew Percy uh, joined a coalition of parliamentarians from the UK, the US, Israel, Australia and Canada to launch a task force to combat online anti-Semitism. Can you tell the listeners what work this group has been doing or has done? and explain how hard it is to combat online anti-Semitism and what can be done to counter it. So actually, we've, we've now added members to the, to the international panel from Europe as well. And mm -hmm. our next session is next week in Brussels, which I'm um, hopefully going to going to attend. So 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 we've actually got a you know, big coverage. I think where Jewish communities are around the world, uh, Europe, the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, Israel, that covers, you know, a large part of it. And, you know, actually the other places with lots of Jewish community places like U Ukraine, um, and we hope they're going to come on board. Obviously, they've got other other pressing yes. issues yeah. at the moment. Um, but again, um, minority rights are really important for the Ukrainian government, Ukrainian parliament. So so we hope to welcome them in time as well. Um, and actually, I think that um, there's a number of things there that actually are, are mixed up in those sort of geopolitical and global issues. So and this is a bit of a hobby horse of mine. In in one European country, we have very significant members of the Jewish community of their diaspora who are hate figures. And it creates a huge amount of anti-Semitism in that country mm -hmm. uh, and are used as a political football for the leader of the country to get re-elected. And it's very reminiscent of what of what has happened over time. Yes. That you know the Jewish community is a political football, the other you know, a fifth column, etc., and are used for extremists to get elected. And I think once more, this is this is sadly happening in modern day Europe. Um, so that's what, and actually, there's a misinformation disinformation role, uh, and we're seeing some of that actually being pumped out uh, by Moscow and the Putin administration as well in terms of online anti-Semitic tropes and narratives. So there is geopolitics mixed up there, but actually more broadly, the work of the panel has been looking at more mainstream yes. providers and how they can stop um, anti-Semitism. So, you know, those sort of providers we talk about all the time, Twitter, obviously mm. have gone backwards recently, Facebook, TikTok, um, et cetera. So those are the main issues we have. And we've engaged with, with people from right across all the countries that I named uh, and 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 the EU in terms of experts and organisations uh, there to look at ways we can look at having time legislation. So actually, they're really interested, the other countries are really interested in the online safety bill, which is currently going through Parliament, and actually want the detail of its model in their own countries. And actually, we then come in and, and talk about maybe ways that that can be strengthened and some of the demerits of that bill. And me and Andrew might not exactly have the same views, but we, we have the same thrust um, and and that helps them because they're legislators in their own countries, and they are trying to to uh, lobby to have to have um, legislation online safety. So you know the government say it's world leading. That is true, but you also want to future proof it. And and world world leading when there isn't much in the rest of the world isn't that much of a boast. So um, especially when all the other countries are looking at you for leadership. So so we've got a real role there, and it is really valuable. Um, some people don't see the value in, in legislators from different countries sharing best practice. But I think 
in many areas it is so vital and valuable and improves Absolutely. what's happening in your own country. And actually, in this case, it might not benefit the UK usually, but it probably will benefit the EU, the US, Canada, Australia, etc. Yeah. And, you know, and that is part of our role as well. Absolutely. And um, the second part to that is what, you know, advice or tips would you give uh, to combat online anti-Semitism? So if somebody encounters it, for example, on Twitter or, or another platform like that. I mean, always report, always report. Um, I mean, you know, quite often, I mean, I'll give an example, actually, of, of um, uh, how I've been a victim of this in the past. So uh, quite early on in my parliamentary career, um, I um, spoke in the Holocaust Memorial Day speech and Channel 4 put the speech on their Facebook page with so much anti-Semitic um, uh, hatred on it and then there was a whole thing about whose responsibility it was to police the cop channel for denied it was their responsibility facebook no it's their responsibility and we went mm -hmm. to, you know senior people in public affairs in the uk i mean channel 4 is just uk uh, but facebook is global about this and it, and it just showed um the problem and that's why you know i think that, that uh, actually there's publisher responsibility and this is why we need the online safety bill a very strong online safety bill more recently I and people have misunderstood the point I was trying to make on Twitter, but um, I spoke out against the the um, the fact that venues were hosting Roger Waters, and my yes, view is that yes. Roger Waters, and it's actually continued proved to be right, is is clearly not just a critic of the Israeli government, which I do not have a problem with, but also is it clearly anti-Semitic. And Dave Gilmore, another member of Pink Floyd, backed up this point, and also, and just as importantly, I have to say. Uh, was pushing out pro-Putin propaganda on Ukraine, um, which actually for me currently is 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 just, you know, people shouldn't be giving platforms, shouldn't be giving venues. We just hosted Ukraine's Eurovision and then, yes. you know, yeah. venue just down the road, host, then host Roger Waters. So um, my people thought I was trying to get the government to ban Roger Waters, which is not what I was trying to do. I was trying to say to the venues, as I have for years with anti-Semites and fascists and others, uh, that the venue shouldn't host that artist. And it's up to the venue where they host them, do not. The venues did, uh, probably because they're commercial interests. What I was asking was for them not to. It was a request. No, I wasn't trying to, I'm not saying, I don't believe that, that we should legislate against venues and say who they can and who they cannot host, but venues themselves can make decisions. So that, that was where I was, that was the point at the moment. But coming around to the point, I got quite a lot of anti Semitic um, abuse. You know, people saying, I got my orders from the Israeli government, <laughs> anybody who listens to me, my comments the Israeli government would know it's such a nonsense. Um, and, you know, the, the embassy and all of that, you know, the typical stuff that you get, you know, if if you, you stand up for these things. And, and again, Twitter did absolutely nothing. I muted the, the people putting mm. stuff out. That's basically the best I can hope for in the current current ownership model of Twitter, which is why we need legislation. Absolutely, yeah. No, and I'm sorry that you've had to deal with that. Um, uh, and also, as we've touched on, you know, yourself being Jewish and in the public eye as an MP, you also led the debate on the Polish anti-defamation -def uh, law in 2018. Um, could you talk about, you know, some of the um, abuse that you faced from that and how you personally dealt with it? I think that there's a misunderstanding I mean, one there was was definitely the Polish far right who definitely didn't misunderstand. But there's a misunderstanding yeah. generally about the objection. So, so the the law would have effectively whitewashed any Polish involvement in the Holocaust. Now, the vast majority of the, of the Polish population, which we have to remember was under occupation of Nazis and, and suffered hugely, did not support the Holocaust or sending Jews to extermination camps, ghettos, etc. But there were a small minority of Poles that collaborated. And this law would have effectively outlawed anybody in Poland making those points. And I think that that is, that again, you know, talking about freedom of speech, that's sort of the, the extreme opposite of trying to curtail freedom of speech and revisionism of history. I really cannot abide revision of history. And so um, we had the debate. We had, we've got one MP of Polish descent who in fact chairs the Polish group here 
we very strongly had an opposing view and we agree to differ on this. Um, and um, but, but most of the people in that debate were supportive of, of my position, actually, that the, partly through the um, internal Polish democratic institutions and partly because of the pressure of international that law didn't proceed but it's we need to be you know the still saying government Poland, we need to be vigilant about this um and we can't really have any revisions in history of what happened in the holocaust absolutely yeah i agree as well and and stuff like this is also happening in in hungary as well right now so yeah. um yeah so it's worrying um how important is it to have a new National Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre built in the UK and right at the heart of democracy as well? What kind of message does that send out? I think I think we do have a lot of institutions just to really re, just to reflect that um, and to do great work. I just went to the Northern Holocaust Education Centre, which is based at the University of Huddersfield, which is based around testimony, including one of my constituents, but of, of Holocaust survivors from the north of England mainly who came on the kinder transport but not solely yes, yeah. some of them went through the camps um and uh we, we have great organizations like the holocaust educational trust and, and holocaust moral trust and others who do absolutely brilliant work but reflecting my experience MP, lots of school groups come to westminster and spend half a day in parliament doing parliamentary things those same schools do 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 Holocaust education and then having a centre literally abutting the the, the parliamentary education centre, it would literally, it's just on the other side of the wall, uh, round the corner, you know, so to go out of the estate. But it would mean that, that, that schools and other visitors to parliament could go and visit that centre. And it would, would mean, if you think about where you're going to place somewhere like that, which would get the most footfall, then it is the most logical place to have it by Parliament mm -hmm. because of where people's interests lie in both of those issues. Um, so I do think it's really important. It is taking a long time. I understand why. There is some opposition. I have to say it's a bit nimbyist. Um, but um, I do think it's usually important that we have the centre and that the centre is where we've already identified it to be. Absolutely. Um, I agree with that. Um, and the final question, um, a lot of young people and a lot of people in general would agree that a key way to combat future anti-Semitism is through educating young people. Um, one charity in particular who does this is the Holocaust Educational Trust, which I'm a regional ambassador for. Um, how important is the work the trust does for young people and Holocaust education? I think it is usually important. I think what you do as regional ambassador I think the work that, that that HEP do, taking young people on school visits physically to Auschwitz-Birkenau, you, you, yeah. you don't really, I've not been, I'm, I'm planning to go this summer, actually. I was going to email Karen Pollock today about it, in <laughs> fact, who's the CEO yeah. of the yeah. Yeah. Trust, who I coincidentally also went to university with. Um, <laughs> so she's another, another Leeds University graduate. We're all doing very well. Um, uh, so, um, but, but I think, you know, that it, it just brings the reality of it. To, to young people, particularly those who aren't Jewish, who haven't been brought up with it, who 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 it's it is just a part of their curriculum, how monstrous and brutal it was. And I think actually at the moment it's even more alive. Um I went to Ukraine in February and I went to Babinya, which is where hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian Jews were murdered. Literally they were just shot in cold blood by the Nazis after being promised safe passage to Palestine. That was that why they that Jews voluntarily went there. And there's a memorial there. And um, the guy just put a piece of metal in my hand, and I wasn't sure why. And he said, this is from a Russian missile. It killed a family of six right here on the memorial. And so it's not wow. just a piece of history. Yeah, You know, there's a, there's a genocidal attack going on mm. today in the same place as, as the Holocaust happened. Yeah, yeah, you know, and and with the same ideology behind it, you know, it's about erasure of a nation, national identity, uh, the war in Ukraine, you know, underlying there's lots of other things going on, but underlying it, and so, you know, we need lessons of history that apply to today, and that is one, and so it's not just a bit of theory, but actually it's something where, and not just there, with you know, we can talk about lots of different places in the world, 
Sudan, um, yeah. uh, the, the the Uyghurs, Rohingya, yeah. just, you know, the Yazidis, yeah. although not quite so much very right now with the Yazidis, but 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 very recently. Mm-hmm. Where where pe- where peoples are under genocidal attacks, and so it is a lesson from history that can be applied directly to them. Thank you, and um, thank you for answering all of my questions as well. Uh, really insightful, and I appreciate the time you've taken to um, allow me to ask you the questions as well. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot. I hope I haven't embarrassed Karen. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. She'll be very pleased. She'll be very pleased. <laughs>